Have you ever seen this switch on your amp and wondered what it is and why it is there? Well, today I will be answering the highly debated question, what is a standby switch and what is its purpose? The very first amp to ever feature a standby switch was the 1955 Fender Bassman 5E6 designed by Leo Fender. Like most amp builders, Leo did not go to school for amp building, but rather learned circuit design and repair by reading old tube manuals and radio manuals. Online, you will find many people debating why Leo decided to install a standby switch. Most people will talk about tubes needing time to warm up before they are able to properly conduct. And while this is true, this idea has been severely misunderstood. This theory originated in online forums after some people read in an RCA tube manual about some tubes needing upwards of 20 minutes to warm up in order to operate properly and claim this is the reason why Leo installed the standby switch. However, these people failed to realize that warm up times vary drastically depending on the tube. For example, this 866A commonly found in large radio transmitters like ham radios does need 15 to 20 minutes to warm up to work properly, but a 6V6 commonly found in guitar amps only needs about 11 seconds of warm up to work properly. Others claim that the standby switches were installed in order to allow musicians to leave their amps on but kill the sound while they took a break to grab a drink. However, this theory falls flat as there are way more cheaper and easier ways to kill the sound electronically speaking than installing a switch, and Leo knew this. So why did Leo install the standby switch? As demands for more powerful and louder amps grew, Leo released the Basement 5E6. This amp was the highest voltage amp Leo had ever released yet, featuring over 420 volts in the power supply section, compared to the earlier release amps such as the Fender Princeton 5E2 that's highest voltage was only 320 volts and coincidentally did not feature a standby switch. In order for us to understand why Leo installed the standby switch, we first need to look at the component that first comes into contact with the high voltage in the power supply, the electrolytic capacitors. Listed on the side of every capacitor is a voltage rating. You can see here that the caps found inside of the Princeton and the Fender basement are both rated for 450 volts. This is the max voltage that the cap can operate at without failing. If we subtract the voltage rating of the capacitor by the voltage found in the power supply, we can see here that the Fender Princeton has 130 volts till we reach the max voltage of the capacitor, while the Fender Baseman only has 30 volts till we reach the max voltage rating of the capacitor. Now you might be asking yourself, what does any of this have to do with a standby switch? Well, in order for us to see the full picture, we also need to understand how a tube works. Located inside of a tube is a filament. You can think of this part as a little fire inside of the tube. Next we have the cathode. I like to think of this as a frying pan. Located on the surface of the cathode is electrons. You can picture these as an egg. And lastly we have the anode, represented by a very hungry mouth. Electrons naturally want to move from the cathode to the anode of the tube, but in order for this to happen, we have to give the filament time to warm up the cathode so it can properly conduct, or in reference to our example, we have to take the time to build the fire so it can heat the pan that then cooks the egg, making it safe to eat. If we do not give the cathode adequate time to heat up, then the electrons or the egg will not cook properly. If you flip an amp on with cold tubes, they will not be able to conduct properly. When this happens, there is little to no current draw, resulting in the power supply seeing an open circuit or no load. Using Ohm's law, we know that if there is very low to no current and high resistance, this will result in very high voltages in the power supply. When this happens, the high voltage listed in the power supply could exceed the number listed in the schematic. If we take another look at the voltage rating of the caps found in the Princeton and basement, we can see that the Princeton's caps have 130 volts till they reach max voltage, while the basement caps only have 30 volts till reaching max voltage. The chances of the voltage in the power supply of the Princeton raising 130 volts while the tubes begin to warm up and conduct is not very likely. However, the chances of the voltages in the power supply of the basement rising 30 volts while the tubes are warming up and beginning to conduct is extremely high. That means that the voltage rating of the capacitors will be exceeded. This can result in damage to the cap, the cap failing, or even exploding. 
But we need to remember that tubes and guitar amps relatively don't need a lot of time to warm up. So if we were to flip an amp on with cold tubes, we would initially see a spike in the voltage of the power supply. This is the point where we can see the voltage exceed the voltages listed in the schematic. But as the tube begins to conduct, the power supply then begins to sense a load, resulting in the voltage in the power supply quickly falling before leveling out to the voltage listed in the schematic. Now if we take a look at the Fender Princeton, we can see that when the amp is flipped on, there is an initial spike in voltage that will exceed the 320 volts listed in the schematic. But as the tubes begin to conduct, this initial spike quickly falls and levels out. Because this amp is operating at a lower voltage, the amp will never be able to rise 130 volts in the time it takes the tubes to start conducting, meaning the voltage rating of the capacitor will never be exceeded. This is why Leo did not install a standby switch on the Fender Princeton. If we were to flip the basement on with cold tubes, we would see an initial spike in voltage that would exceed the 420 volts listed in the schematic. The tube would still begin to conduct and the initial spike would quickly fall. However, because this amp is operating at a higher voltage, the initial spike in the voltage would exceed the voltage rating of the capacitor, which can result in damage to the cap, the cap failing, or even exploding. So what was Leo's solution to this problem? The standby switch. We can see here on the schematic, the on and off switch. When this is flipped on, you are energizing the power transformer and the rectifier of the amp. If you look down here at the power transformer, we can see a little note that reads 6.3 volts to filaments and pilot light. This means that when you flip the on and off switch to the on position, you are sending voltage to the filaments of the tubes. This is the equivalent of taking the time to build the fire from our example from earlier. When you have an amp with a standby switch, you are supposed to flip the on and off switch, then wait 10 to 15 seconds, then flip the standby switch. During this 10 to 15 second waiting period, you are giving the filaments, or the fire, enough time to heat up the cathode, or the frying pan, so it can conduct properly. Now if we take a look at the standby switch, we can see that when in the off position, it is disconnecting the high voltage from the caps. After waiting the 10 to 15 seconds, you can then flip the standby switch, and because the tubes have had plenty of time to warm up, they will begin conducting the second you flip the switch. This results in no voltage spikes in the power supply, meaning that the cap's voltage rating will never be exceeded. I also wanted to mention something else that could happen when you apply voltage to a cold tube, and that is cathode stripping. Now, we don't have enough time in today's video to cover this as it is a very in-depth topic, but I do plan on making a video on it very, very soon. So now that we know that Leo installed the standby switch to protect the caps from reaching their max voltage rating, as well as protect the tubes from cathode stripping, let's do a quick recap. As the demand for more powerful and louder amps grew, Leo began designing amps with a lot higher voltage. Due to the amp being ran at a higher voltage, the capacitors were also seeing a higher voltage, thereby lowering the amount of volts till reaching the max voltage rating of the cap. When tubes are cold, they cannot conduct properly. This results in little to no current draw, causing the power supply to see no load or an open circuit. This can result in the power supply voltages rising above the voltages listed on the schematic. Tubes found in guitar amps have a relatively low warm-up time, so when you flip an amp on with cold tubes, you will see an initial spike in the power supply voltages, but as the tube quickly begins to warm up and conduct, the voltage will quickly fall back down and level out. In some amps, this is fine because the volts till the max cap voltage is so high that the initial spike in voltage will never exceed the voltage rating of the cap. In some amps that use higher voltage, the volts till the max cap voltage is very low. This means that the initial spike in the power supply voltage can exceed the cap's voltage rating. This can result in the cap failing or even exploding. To fix this issue, Leo installed an on and off switch that when flipped on, sent 6.3 volts to the filaments of the tubes that then warm up the cathode of the tube, allowing the tubes time to properly conduct. After waiting 10 to 15 seconds, you then flip the standby switch that then supplies the voltage to the rest of the amp. Because the tubes have been given the proper time to warm up, they are able to conduct the second that you flip the switch. 
This results in no voltage spike in the power supply, thereby the caps will never exceed their voltage rating. I post a wide variety of musical instrument repair content weekly, so if you enjoyed today's video learning about the history of the standby switch, please be sure to like and follow for more.